let's, let's reconvene so we can maximize our time in discussion. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, Marie Walker, I just wanted to introduce everyone else who's on the dais with us in the order you see them. Uh, Professor Joseph P. Gaughan is immediately to the left of Professor Tynes, then Professor Manuela Barreto, then Professor G. Nick Ryder, Professor Daniel Eisenberg, and Professor, Professor Merrill Alper. Obviously, you'll be hearing a lot more from all of them, but at least uh, to, to welcome them officially to the conference. So at this point, I will turn it over to my colleague, Marie Walker. Okay. Um, so those were both very fascinating, I th I'd say cutting edge talks on technology and mental health and um, discrimination as they would impact youth. I'm thinking that your colleagues might have some thoughts or questions or comments that you might have um, about the talks that you heard. Does anybody um, want to open up with some sort of t question or comment? I can, if the sound is working. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Dr. Alpert, did you? Oh, okay. oh good. sure. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I found both talks incredibly interesting thinking about, you know, we can talk about technology as a cause or as a variable in mental health, but also for mental health assessments is really interesting. Um, and I was really struck by Brindesha's talk, um, the TikToks that you had shown of the, um, of the young women talking about the filters and the effects of you know, sort of seeing uh, other uh, beauty standards imposed upon them by the technology. And I've recently been looking at TikTok as a space of understanding how young people are coping with the world. And so one thing that struck me was thinking about how there might be a positive, you know, mental health effect of being able to uh, look at somebody or see or interact with somebody through the comments potentially who's having a shared experience with you. And so there being potentially a short-term maybe positive effect. But then also you could watch a video and that could also make you feel bad about yourself. Even if you feel good, but because you're identifying with something, um, you might then be negatively affected by knowing, oh, there's filters in the world that reify a beauty standard I don't fit into, and that could make you feel bad too. So wondering to what extent you might think how the utility of studying these things in the short term and the long term, and what those, what, in what way social media in that way might be a mixed bag of being able to identify with somebody, but at the same time being reminded of that, you know, discriminatory experience can also just make you feel bad, especially if you consume a lot of content and the algorithm keeps feeding you more of that content too. So I, I, okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, so we're finding that um, being able to ask people about these experiences um, and the, the particularly the positive um, experiences that, that people have, the fact that we did not find that they were associated with mental, negative mental health outcomes has us questioning whether maybe the positive experiences will be a buffer. Um, and you know, we think that the benefits will sort of outweigh any sort of negatives that might be associated with being reminded of your experiences. And so, yeah, I mean, we can have more of a conversation about it, but, and, and we're definitely going to be analyzing in the future, like whether the positive experiences are a buffer. Um, and I'll, I'll keep you posted. Great, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking also about Brindisha's presentation, although I really like Priscilla's too. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Um, about the fact that, you know, some, you know, devil's advocate might say um, being exposed to that kind of contact would be harmful to anyone. So irrespective of your uh, racial background, seeing such horrendous contact is shocking. Um, it's, it makes you think that the world is a really hostile place. Um, 
I think I know what the answer is to, to my question, but I wanted to know whether you have looked at that in more detail, or in other studies perhaps, or with other methods, at how the differential harm that it makes when you are part of that group or you're not part of that group. That's a really good question. Mike, can Mike, closer to your mic? Well, it's on. It just it's on. Closer. Oh, sorry. Um, it's a really good question. We haven't looked at the differences. Um, and I am actually interested if, in, interested in finding out if white people actually feel, you know, feel bad when they see, you know, like a, a police killing um, of an unarmed black person. And so maybe future work will, will look at those yeah. differences. So there, there is some work that would suggest that indeed they do, but of course the extent to which you feel bad really depends on your own personal involvement with that group because clearly it is a possible future for you, it's not a possible future for someone else, right? So, so there is some work that would suggest that, but not, not really looking at the exact kinds of stimulus you're looking at, which is really sort of, the impact of it is that it's daily and it's relentless and continuous, and I think it would be really important to make that point. And, and I also think sort of identifying with the police and sort of, you know, revering these people who are committing this terror um, may also play a role as well. I'm wondering what... Daniel has a comment. Oh, Daniel, okay. Oh, sorry. I'm yeah. an awesome moderator, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> noticing. Um, th thank you. Yeah, no, uh, I wanted to ask Priscilla if I could. Uh, th I thought the um, virtual reality uh, technique was a fascinating a way of understanding something and just wanted to hear a little bit more about what is that like for the participants? Do they, do, like, how real does it really feel to them? And then is that something you can also kind of manipulate? Can you make it feel more real by, like, having them think or, or maybe actually having, like, other subjects being the ones speaking for the avatar, or do they think that it's just kind of a, a role play that's coming from, you know, like the research team? Does, does, it's interesting that you got stress levels even when probably some of them understood that it was just role play, right? It wasn't like a real interaction in a sense, or, or not, I don't know. Yeah, so um, several things, I think, um, there's some individual differences in terms of how, um, real they think or how immersed they are in it. So um, several factors that affect what we call presence in virtual reality research is um, kind of how realistic the avatars might be, the artifacts in the environment. Um, but also what's important is um, we tell participants what to anticipate in, in the situation. We tell them this could be stressful and then um, you are at a party. And um, so that increases their sense of immersion um, and their presence. And we do actually um, have data about their ratings of immersion and realism of the virtual reality uh, environments. And then also they kind of tell us did you, part did you participate in the scenario as you would in real life? So on average, our participants say it's you know, on a scale of one to five, five being the highest level of immersion realism, they say it's about three, and three to four. So they, they also understand from their qualitative response, they know this is not real life, they are going through some kind of role play and simulation. They do know they're talking to a person, sometimes like, they think it's AI, um, or sometimes they think like, is this an actual person I'm talking to? Um, so, but then like, regardless, they, um, they are showing genuine responses. Um, so, so, so it kind of depends like also maybe people who have more experience Previously, with virtual reality, they're gonna rate it a little bit less realistic just because they're like, ooh, this guy is kind of creepy. It does not really look like a real human being. But nevertheless, the experience can be um, uh, quite similar to what they experience in real life. So Priscilla and I have been having a conversation about this, and I've been telling her that my blood pressure is still up <laughs> after watching the, those VR experiences, I just sort of felt for the participants. Um, and I find it extremely unethical to willingly expose people to discrimination um, that is, is so realistic. Um, and I mean, you see their stress levels rise. Um, and that I think 
is harmful. Like with the amount of discrimination that black people experience every day, to willingly expose them in the name of science, I find just particularly egregious. So can you just, can you talk about the ethics involved and, and how you get over like doing this study, expo harming people in the name of science? Yeah, I think that's a great question. That's why we're here um, <laughs> at a conference that speaks to both science and ethics. Um, so I think several things, um, you know, we, prior to the, the study, um, we, we have kind of built up to this particular uh, study where we've involved, um, you know, focus groups and asking participants about their lived experiences so using observational methods that I was talking about. And, um, and then they kind of rate some of the, um, in, including our research uh, team that's um, including of diverse um, uh, kind of uh, groups of color, um, uh, research assistants and other consultants um, with expertise in the content. So we have chosen some of the scenarios that are not the most blatant, um, you know, very, um, you know, exceedingly harmful um, scenarios. And at the same time, um, I think uh, there are several issues to consider in terms of scientific like advancements. I think um, for us to understand something, um, it's oftentimes a trade-off between sort of what, you know, sort of the gain from the study for the general public, the masses, as much as possible, so that we have the tools to not only advocate and kind of understand the lived experiences and help other people also understand the lived experiences, um, and also find ways that can actually mitigate the negative um, impacts. So part of the, the draw of virtual reality, as our research participants told us, is you can actually use this to train people to adapt to these incidences and also train bystanders and allies to disarm discrimination experiences. So, so it has multiple benefits. Um, and here we're talking about sort of basic understanding of the, the causal effects and mechanisms. Um, and uh, we do have safeguards in place, um, as with uh, you know, ethical research, is um, we consult heavily with our human subjects protection um, boards, and um, we have consent and reconsent process and debriefing process. So each step of the way, we ask, well, one, we tell them if any part of the study is uncomfortable, you don't want to continue, um, you can leave, and there's no penalty, um, you can still get your compensation as promised. And we also tell them, as part of the study, you can experience um, stress or discomfort. Um, and uh, according to our uh, consultation with the Human Subjects uh, Protection Board, it is, they consider, we consider it's no more than um, sort of experiences that are out of the ordinary for people of color. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, people uh, experience discrimination and stress on a daily basis. Um, and this will be consistent and similar to some of the experiences. And we have safeguards in place that people get resources um, if they do experience or maybe are triggered or traumatized or in some ways um, experience mental health problems, we have resources available to them. Um, and you know they can call us if anything happens. And um, from at the debriefing, and also we have follow-up ethics um, study that we asked, we contacted these participants in the virtual reality study several weeks and up to you know seven months after, and kind of asked them, hey, remember the study that you participated in? How much distress, how much uh, harmful uh, maybe alcohol use have you engaged the day of or after the study? And um, do you think the study actually was ethical? Um, do you think the researchers treated you with respect, allowed you to make your informed decision to participate, and did you experience harm, and what degree of harm did you experience as part of the study? And our research participants rated um, that the study was highly ethical, um, that the researchers treated them with care, they did not feel like they experienced harm on a scale of one to seven, the average is one point something, um, and also they also felt like they um, had the 
agency to, to decide to participate or not. So nobody had um, terminated the study prematurely, nobody had asked, for, actually like wanted to take the mental health resources, um, and this is at debriefing after the studies, even when we recontacted them. So, so I do think um, there are um, issues, sort of any research studies have ethical issues and potential you know, um, sort of ethical concerns, and we take, do take it very seriously. So um, you know, as some of the, the technologies and more research tools and methods are made available to scientists, I think it's important that we ask the, the, the folks that we conduct research with and um, want to serve, kind of ask them about their perspectives. So, yeah. I, and I'm thinking, um, Dr. Tynes, I know that you are very much an advocate for digital media literacy. And I've, I've heard you speak or, or write about um, how do we equip young people of color to deal with microaggressions, and I, I wonder, is this a possible method or is, you know, and, and I also do know that your research, your tra tra trajectory is going from correlational research, saying how microaggressions are tied into mental health issues and trying to create an experimental paradigm, right? So I just wonder if there's any, I don't know, middle ground or teaching ground with this sort of um, so we research. just proposed, we submitted a proposal to NIH to use VR to train people to cope with um, the experiences that they have online, but we are not going to expose them to discrimination. We're going to have them imagine an experience that they've already had and um, teach them the coping, st coping skills they need and then have them practice but we're not going to create a VR experience where people are harmed. Right. Okay. Yes, please, Dr. Gan. I uh, really appreciate this exchange. It, um, it raises a question I hadn't thought about and the ethics of it, and I think it's important to think it through. A few thoughts come to mind in response. Um, one, I think, is that, you know, um, in this work, we often proceed together in collective fashion to try to counter uh, the kinds of racism that endures in American society today. And yet, I think that all racisms are not created equal in America. And so I think part of what might be important to introduce is the recognition that different groups have different experiences with, of racism in America and, and do so, have that in different domains in different ways. And, I think that anti-black racism is especially pernicious and has been for a very, very long time. To me, it matters whether your group has been allowed or not in American history to marry into whiteness or not. And um, American Indian people, I'm American Indian, uh, we have been allowed to marry into whiteness. It means that a lot of American Indian people today have mixed ancestry. And we just don't have the concerted campaign that has carried on for so, so long, even though we continue to experience racism and discrimination in all kinds of instances. So I think that's one subtlety to track here. A second thing is I'm struck by the relationship of the outcomes we're talking about. So we talk about stress. Um, we talk about uh, symptoms. We talk maybe about distress. Um, and we talk about harm. And of course, in the back of it all, or underneath all those mental health problems, or what psychiatrists and psychologists might think of as mental disorders. And of course, those are, are not all the same thing. You know, it's a spectrum between stress, which is everyone has stress every day, I think, um, all the way to disorder, which is more the exception rather than the norm. Um, and so harm, and how we imagine and conceive of harm, takes on an important role, maybe definitionally, in terms of what we consider and conceive to be harms. Um, so I think that these are two things that have raised in my mind as we have this conversation, just in terms of parsing out some of this. The third thing that really strikes me here, I'll just put on the table as well, is you know here we are outside of the, of the Twin Cities in Minnesota, pretty rural Minnesota. I look at our in-person audience. I don't know who all is on here, but you know I suspect that racism for a lot of you in our audience might feel like an exotic, like maybe that happens down south or in the big city, but not around here. <laughs> and I just wonder, I probably there's some engagement with our audience about assumptions and expectations and orientations to what racism is. You know, we talked about microaggressions this morning. Um, microaggressions are interesting because, at least as originally conceived, they were defined as, um, you know, somewhat ambiguous. 
Um, but if it's ambiguous, then that means we don't really know if it was intending to be discriminatory or not. And in part, it makes me wonder about these dynamics because if someone you know, calls you a racial slur to your face, it's like a slap. You know what it is, you know what to do, and you react however you react to that. If someone microaggresses you in a way that's ambiguous, I just wonder, how long do you spend sitting there turning over in your mind, what did that really mean? What did that person, what was that person trying to convey? Uh, did they mean it? Are they ignorant? What, you know, just try to get around it. So those are different dynamics as well that I think are worth introducing to this conversation. If I can add to that too, the question of not only is it a person, but is it a bot? Like, am I even being engaged by an actual person with these views? Or has this been manufactured to, to surround me? And, and that itself is another kind of stress as well. Um, and so thinking about the, the uncertainties that young people are engaging with online, because it's, it, it is one thing to know who you're encountering, and, but you don't necessarily know if whose avatar or profile picture it is online is that person or not. And so I think that, um, and especially when you consider how cheap and easy and fast and quick it can be to mobilize this kind of hate online, um, yeah, that, that part of like who's doing this to me becomes this bigger question mark. Yeah, and I think that relates to thinking about Russian interference and, and Facebook and, um, you know, who do I trust, right? Um, can I trust the person I'm talking to online or can I not? And it, I mean, I imagine for young people especially, it's very isolating. I, so, I, I, um, and I'm sure this, this will come up again. So I, I do want to engage our audience too and ask them um, some questions here or ask some of the questions that they have, have put forth. And um, so one of them is, I'll just read this. Obviously, anxiety and mental illness issues are more prevalent than ever, and the solutions are complicated. Have society's values and motivations changed over time to the point of causing this mental health crisis? For example, the economy is growth-driven, which does not seem sustainable. Has this consumption-based growth mindset contributed to widespread mental illness? And what about other societal, societal pressures? So um, over time, how has mental health, the mental health crisis been impacted by things that are going on in society right now? Big question, but um, any thoughts on that? And um, our economist, uh, well, <laughs> Daniel Eisenberg. This, this, my answer has nothing to do with economics, but, um, but I, I just would point people to uh, one, a uh, piece of research by Jean Twenge and colleagues. Um, they published this in 2010 or around there. It's an interesting study looking at the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Disorder, MMPI, that goes back to the 1930s, and they kind of collected every piece of data they could on young people taking the MMPI, which has some uh, qu questions about depressive symptoms and other aspects of mental health, and they found that there's actually a steady rise and apparent depression and, and anxiety as well, I think, since the 1930s in the US going through like 2005. Um, and their best explanation was kind of sociological. It had to do with a shift in society to more of an extrinsic motivations, like a popularity, success, uh, money, fame, um, and less kind of more what would be considered intrinsic uh, kind of self-fulfillment, more kind of intrinsic values. I think it's, you know, it's all very circumstantial evidence, but that, I, thought, I found that compelling. Okay, looking, looking to a wealth or fame as, as ways to gauge your success in the world might be something that's, that's related to that increase in mental, mental illness that we're seeing. Yeah, Dr. Gaughan. And sorry, you see us flapping around up here. There's a lot of flying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's going on up here? Um, I just want to say that I think there's a generational shift, too, in terms of how we think about um, racism, of course, and the threat that it poses for people. Um, you know, when I grew up on primetime television was a sitcom called All in the Family. Some of you remember Archie Bunker, for example. And of course, his bigotry was, he was a buffoon, essentially, but his bigotry was part of that buffoonery. But he said things on primetime TV that, of course, you would never say today by today's standards. 
you know, I felt like the lesson of Archie Bunker for me was, yeah, there are bigots in the world, but someone like Archie Bunker has no power. He was a forklift operator down at the plant, whatever plant that was, you know, a union guy, whatever. So he was this buffoon, probably because of his class background, being working class, who would say all this stuff. Um, but Archie Bunker is not going to deny you a mortgage. He's not going to stop you from your promotion at work and those sorts of things. So the kind of structural elements of racism versus the kind of interpersonal bigotry you might encounter, to me, are really different kinds of things. And in my own life, at least, I have felt like if a, if a bigot says something ignorant to me, I used to hear growing up, sticks and stones you know, can br break my bones, but names can never hurt me. That was our saying, right? And so there's a sense about how do you come to insulate yourself a little bit from people's ignorance, even as the structural stuff is what can stop you from having a life that you've been aiming for and some maybe foothold in the American dream that supposedly we've been promised in this society. So I think that that's a generational difference that might matter a little bit here too. But what about if Archie Bunker calls the police on you, on a black person? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, and, and um, I think there were probably episodes about that actually, so that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Dr. Helper. Yeah, I think when we're talking about mental health and we're talking about like this present moment, it is helpful to look at the past. We, I think we have to because we also have to reckon with how mental health has been measured and framed in our society in kind of the first place. So thinking about how the very diagnostic tools themselves have been developed in ways that were like not just subtly, but like expressly homophobic, like expressly transphobic, expressly racist. And they were kind of designed to be, um, like they were designed to pathologize people and designed to institutionalize people. So there's like a whole you know, broad history of, of that in the US around, that's very eugenic. It's very rooted in, you know, who gets to procreate, who's deemed to be mentally fit or unfit. And so when we talk about mental health and we talk about this very present moment, um, there's the historian in me that says we also have to recognize how the way we even define it, how we um, measure it, um, things that we maybe think of as sort of neutral, objective, their, their numbers, um, the ways that those histories shape the legacies of, you know, whose care is deemed important and whose care would have been sort of offloaded um, a century ago to, you know, to being excluded from society altogether. Yeah, okay. Um, it, I'm, I'm going to go back to our, our audience and ask for an, another question from them that they put forth, and I believe, and I'm sorry we can't uh, get to all the questions. I apologize to those in the audience who've put them out there. but. I'm going to ask this one. As technology advances, the tactics for cyberbullying and online discrimination will diversify. How can combatants for this bullying and discrimination match this progression in technology? <laughs> Sorry, match the what? The, te the progression in technology. So how can... So as, as the technology um, progresses and maybe cyberbullying and discrimination get, I don't know, more insidious or yeah. become, um, I, I just think about what you talked about is mm -hmm. that, you know, taking someone's images and creating something so it makes them yeah. look like they're doing or saying something that mm -hmm. they haven't. So, mm -hmm. so that sort of idea, how can we counteract this progression? What do we need to do? So I think the average person um, can advocate for people online. They can model for folks how you critique racism, how you stand up to somebody who is um, trolling or, some, or stand up to misogynoir. Um, and you can educate yourself about America's history. Um, read all the banned books, <laughs> every single one, um, and just be ready, you know, like an army, um, to fight for justice in these online spaces. Yeah. We've got time for another. Okay. 
We have time for one more question. And, um, and it's nice to also, I think, be able to think about, as you were saying, ways to like help, ways to change. And so this question is saying, people of color experience countless external factors from institutions, everyday interactions online, et cetera, that impact their mental health and well-being. The speakers have talked a lot about how these areas can be systematically improved via educators, program, educators, programs, et cetera. But how can we as peers, which is kind of what you've said, um, minorities or not, support others via in-person or online interactions? And uh, Dr. Tynes or Dr. Loy or any of you on the panel, if you have something you want to say to that. I, I think uh, knowledge helps. It's, a, it's maybe one of the first steps. And certainly ability to um, advocate and disarm these uh, vulnerabilities and risks for other people. So some of the work that we have done, um, particularly during um, the COVID pandemic, was um, you know not only anti-black racism, but also anti-Asian hate, um, was we wanted to understand like, who are the people who are more likely to step in to help, like social, classic social psychology bystander effects. So um, I, I think several things like, what are people needing to be able to become allies? So some of the things in terms of bystander actions have to do with just understanding, right? Reading education, educating about yourself, the histories and the lived experiences of people who are like you and who don't look like you. Um, and the kind of the circumstances that surround, like we talked about mental health disparities and inequities, and um, as well as sort of actual tools that are available, so resources that people can draw from, which scientific information is one way to do so, and also kind of like some of the um, protective factors that we have for ourselves, collective self-esteem, right, racial, private regard, and, um, you know, kind of being able to connect with our ethnic heritage, and that's very important. Um, and then also sort of, you know, people who have privilege, who have the abilities, you know, step in to also help. So I think it's a multi-pronged approach, um, you know, can, can be um, empowering. So, you know, I think we have a lot of uh, similarities in terms of our next step is, after we understand some of the mechanisms, what are the protective factors and how do we actually use the tools that we have to train folks to actually use the, 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 the tools, uh, use the abilities to, able, to be able to disarm and support one another? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I think in order to, in the interest of keeping us on schedule, we'll call this first panel to a, a, a close and thank our presenters and um, all of the discussants. Uh, just a reminder, there's a whole list of things you can do during this noon two-hour period. The workshops are listed, the chapel, um, there is a forum, in the forum that is the basketball part, um, there, are, there are interactive displays, mental health fair. Uh, you can tour Nobel Hall. You can now go inside of it. Uh, and there are art exhibitions, um, and you get out into the Arboretum and just do some walking um, therapy for yourself. At 1220, there is the dedication, as we noted. Uh, food choice information and other such things uh, found on page 27 of the program. Please um, know this is a tobacco-free campus. And please also know that we're trying to be zero waste. So to the extent that you can help us in those efforts, that would be great. And for those of you online, there's a whole uh, slew of really wonderful uh, videos about um, things Gustavus and interviews as well. So thank you. We'll see you back here at 12. Uh, we'll see you back here when the program says. I didn't write that down. <laughs> <laughs>